So here's a little something for you for Spooptober. It's called Dagon. Some of you may know Dagon. Some of you may be friends with Dagon. But what you didn't know about Dagon is that he's also a video game. It's uh, free on Steam, and it looked really cool, and, you know, I'm into the cosmic horror shit a little bit. And this seemed like a really good start to the Spooptober stuff, which, you know, admittedly has taken a little while. We haven't, um, you know, I haven't done a lot of spoopy stuff, aside from maybe a little Castlevania, but... Let's take a look at this, and see what it is. Dagon is a faithful interactive adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's work focused on story and atmosphere. You will not find difficult choices. Action sequences or inventory management here. Movement is limited to progressing through locations along with the plot. I am writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. Okay, so there's interactive elements. And, uh, there's secrets. Okay. So this seems interesting. I mean, again, full gamer mode, make no mistake. Meaning, I don't really have to think. I can just enjoy the story. Which I've read Dagon, by the way. It's really good. And I'm gonna tell you about this Lovecraft documentary I watched. In a couple minutes. Penniless, and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable. I can bear the torture no longer and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. You like how I already missed a thing? When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess, though never fully realize why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. Yeah, there was a paper on the floor that was glowing and I missed it. And the reason I missed it is because I was like, oh, I'll touch that thing first. I was like, I'll grab the other thing first, and then, then I'll go and get that. No. I am writing this under no- I was about to say, we've come too far, I can't restart the game now. As to letters, my case is peculiar. I write such things exactly as easily and rapidly as I would utter the same topics in conversation. Indeed, epistolary expression is with me largely replacing conversation. As my condition of nervous prostration becomes more and more acute, I cannot bear to talk much now and becoming as silent as a spectator himself. My loquacity, loquacity extends itself on paper. Throughout his life, Lovecraft penned about a hundred thousand letters to his friends and fa- Imagine if this dude was on social media. How quickly he'd be cancelled. Okay, to be fair. This dude is more than a product of his time. Holy fuck, you gotta watch that Lovecraft documentary. It does not shy away from his intense paranoia and xenophobia. It's- it's a- uh, It's a hell of a thing. But his writings, a lot of that stemmed from that. And his cosmic horror stuff is, to me, ex exceedingly interesting and creepy. Art from artist, you know how it is. Tendency to endless correspondence was relatively late growth. In youth, I scarcely did any letter writing thanking anybody for a present. It was so much of an ordeal, I'd rather have written 250-line pastoral or 20-page treatise on the rings of Saturn. <laughs> Lovecraft would often skip meals to avoid postage. Collections of his correspondence have been published in various books and selected letters can be found online. Some readers consider them his most important legacy. Well, we're not gonna... I don't think I'm gonna read through all of that stuff. Penniless. But a little background is nice. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess though never fully realize why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. We'll increase the volume a little bit. Okay, so um, the Lovecraft documentary is rather interesting. Morphine entered into use in the 19th century was routinely administered to treat severe pain during the American Civil War, World War I. 
It was also sold without restrictions until 1914. Morphine became more popular after the invention of the hypodermic syringe around 1845, uh, 54. Friedrich Saturner, <laughs> I don't know what that voice was, who first isolated the substance, originally named it Morphium. Oh, he was in the Matrix. After Morpheus. Oh, he was in the Matrix, the Greek god associated with dreams. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. At the time when Dagon was published, morphine abuse, known as a soldier's disease, already posed a big problem in the United States. Actually, this history is interesting. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet of which I was supercargo fell a victim to the German Sea Raider. Dagon was written around a month after the United States entered World War I. Maybe, you know what, maybe we shouldn't read all these. Maybe I'll just get them and read them later, because, um, it's gonna interrupt the flow of the story. I'll read this last one. So, um, after the United States entered World War I, Lovecraft was actively interested in its course. He composed many poems, which he uh, gave encouragement to soldiers and commented on the events unfolding in Europe. He tried to enlist in the army, which he mentions in one of the letters to Reinhard Kleiner. Some time ago, impressed by my entire uselessness in the world, <laughs> I resolved to attempt enlistment despite my almost invalid condition. Invalid condition. I argued that if I chose a regiment soon to depart for France, my sheer nervous force, which is not inconsiderable, might sustain me till a bullet or a piece of shrapnel could more conclusively and effectively dispose of me. Holy shit. Even though he passed the physical exam, his mother prevented him from going to the war. Huh. I, again, this dude would have been perfect for social media generation. And then immediately removed from social media. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degradation so that our vessel was made a legitimate prize, whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. Okay. I like this interactive novel approach. Metal Gear perfected it. Nah, just kidding. I love Metal Gear. But I wouldn't mind seeing more so liberal, great indeed, short stories of our captors, adapted like this. That five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water and provisions for a good length of time. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Imagine this. Imagine being out in the open ocean like this on a tiny little boat. No idea where you are. No landmarks. Nothing. Never a competent navigator. I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Of the longitude, I knew nothing and no island or coastline was in sight. Hmm. Maybe my, um... I, I've read some Lovecraft, and there's a lot of interesting stuff that I remember liking. Um, Dagon's definitely good. I forget the one that I like the most, though. Mountains of Madness, Color Out of Space, I really liked. Um, there was another one about a necromancer that was really interesting. That was just him firsthand. It was him basically talking about um, why he didn't like the way cities were transforming because the dude was so afraid of other people and so there, afraid of change. And for uncounted days, I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land.
but neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastness of unbroken blue. You need a volleyball called Wilson to help you out. The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know. For my slumber, though troubled and dream infested, was continuous. <sighs> <sighs> Oh boy, those are, did Lovecraft like hate seafood? Cause it's just like constant squid imagery. What didn't he hate is my question. When at last I awoke, it was to discover myself half sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see. Monotonous undulations. And in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished. For there was in the air and in the rotting soil a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. <laughs> the region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing, and nothing in sight, save a vast reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. Ah, oh, those noises. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing regions for which innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. Yep, that's gotta so be it. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, straining my ears as I might. Nor were there any sea fowl to prey upon the dead things. I'm sorry to ruin the atmosphere, but... Oh no, the poor fish. For several hours I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, what happens when the, the sun goes down? Some of its stickiness and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for traveling purposes in a short time. Because I would hate that. that. I slept but little, oh. and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. I guess a little bit of moonlight. All you really... That's all you really have in a situation like this. I, I love... Um, I love that there's just this, like, atmosphere that you even get from reading it. And this is doing a really good job at translating that into uh, visuals, which notoriously on is difficult morning, for Lovecraft works. I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil and set out boldly for an unknown goal. It's it's a little difficult to adapt Lovecraft in my opinion. Just because part of what makes it so unsettling is how your mind attempts to describe it. 
to your brain, if that makes any sense. It doesn't, but it's not supposed to be a definitive, defined look of a thing, in my opinion. It works better in your imagination. All day, I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. This looks like Half-Life 2 goo. This is where head crabs come from. Oh shit, whale. Is that a humpback whale? I'm, I'm not really sure. I don't know my whales. That night, I encamped, and on the following day still traveled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first espied it. Where do you even attempt to sleep? On, on the tentacle? On a rock? Okay, I'm gonna read this because we haven't gotten a lot of this. The creator of the Cthulhu mythos in the fictional underwater city of Raleo was convinced that life could not exist at the bottom of the ocean because the water pressure would make it uninhabitable. Today we know that the darkest depths of the ocean are home to many peculiar organisms, the deepest dwelling fish we have discovered so far. The Mariana snailfish can live about 8,000 meters, more than 26,000 feet below the ocean's surface, in never-ending darkness and at hellishly crushing pressures hundreds of times stronger than those found at sea level. Upon glancing at the modern photos of deep sea creatures such as the anglerfish and fangtooth or the viperfish and their truly Lovecraftian characteristics, it's hard not to find some irony in this. Yeah, the, the deep ocean is fascinating. And actually really frightening. By the fourth evening, I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance. An intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night. I know. But ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain. I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Sleep no more. That's the thing I go to that has been delayed till January. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again. And in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. Hmm. I was going to mention very quickly that uh, there's an exhibit at the Natural History Museum for the deep ocean and it had uh, really good stuff in it and it, it made me appreciate the fucked up underwater life even more. Contrary to popular opinion, Lovecraft was not an ever frowning, eccentric, grumpy loner. He considered himself to be a person who appreciated humor. Moreover, he would often meet with friends in his apartment or various cafes in Brooklyn and Manhattan. At times his social life was so intensive his work would suffer for months. There was a point when he finally decided he needed to put an end to daily meetings and loitering in New York cafeterias and resorted to hiding at home and reading with the main room light turned off, pretending he wasn't there whenever a friend knocked on his door. He also had another method of deterring his guests, which involved greeting them in a bathrobe with an unmade bed visible in the background and piles of paper scattered across the floor. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me. But I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon. 
whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illumine. I felt myself on the edge of the world, peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of Paradise Lost and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent, whilst after a drop of only a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. This format is really great for short stories. I, I really hope there are more made like this. Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze, I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian deeps where no light had yet penetrated. All at once, my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me an object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. Mm. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself. Oh yeah. But I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express. For despite its enormous magnitude and its position in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. The zenith shone weirdly and vividly. Are those moon runes? Steeps that hemmed in the chasm, or like the the moon glyphs from Lord of the Rings, whatever they were called, and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions, and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me and unlike anything I'd ever seen in books, consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean-risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound. Dagon contains many themes and storytelling methods that Lovecraft developed in his later works, such as telling the story through carvings at the Mountains of Madness and the Nameless City. That might have been it, the Nameless City. I think I read that one. Journals and characters' notes, the shadow out of time and the haunting, sorry, the haunter of the dark. Islands emerging from the ocean, Call of Cthulhu. Or fictional beings and deities based on real events and mythologies, Ego and the Whisperer in Darkness. 
It's also considered the origin of the popular Cthulhu mythos. Yeah, this is this is like kind of the very beginning of that stuff. Some of Lovecraft's other stories also conclude in a manner similar to Dagon, but let's skip the details in order not to spoil the ending. Plainly visible across the intervening water, on account of their enormous size, were an array of bas-reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of a Dore. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men. Hmm. Though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in the waters of some marine grotto, or paying homage at some monolithic shrine, which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail, for the mere remembrance makes me grow faint. Grotesque beyond the imagination of a Poe or a Bulwer. They were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background, for one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented as but little larger than himself. Hmm. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size, but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe. Some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. The Piltdown Man. Lovecraft would often use the latest scientific discoveries as inspiration for his works. He would even update his stories at the last moment in order to make sure they reflected the latest breakthroughs. Unfortunately, this method was not without its flaws. After Lovecraft's death, the Piltdown Man discovery mentioned in Dagon turned out to be a paleo-anthropological fraud. In 1912, Charles Dawson, an amateur archaeologist, announced that he had discovered the missing link between ape and man, the fossilized remains of previously unknown human, uh, early human. Years later, they turned out to be forgery, but by that point, the fraud had already managed to negatively affect the early research on human evolution. In the year when the discovery took place, the majority of the scientific community believed Dawson indeed found the missing link. 1953, Time magazine published evidence proving that Dawson was a con man. It turned out that the fossils of the previously unknown early human consisted of a human skull, the jaw of an orangutan, and chimpanzee teeth. Hmm. Yeah, I had no idea. That would have been just one of those things that, you know... Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception I of just the ignored. daring anthropologist. I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then, suddenly, I saw it. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Oh shit. a stupendous monster of nightmares to the marble, about which it flung its gigantic spinning arms. The wild bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. <laughs> it's the, the famous Lovecraft quote. Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. I think I went mad then. I believe I sang a great deal and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. The otherworldly color in the sky. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm sometime after I reached the boat. At any rate, I know that I heard bells of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest moods.
When I came out of the shadows, I was in a San Francisco hospital. Brought thither by the captain of the American ship which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium, I had said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing. Nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. Lovecraft considered himself to be an atheist, an absolute materialist, which he had attributed partly to his early childhood interest in astronomy and science in general. In his own words, I am indeed an absolute materialist, so far as actual belief goes, with not a shred of credence in any form of supernaturalism, religion, spiritualism, transcendentalism, m m m memes, or immortality. All I say is that I think it is damned unlikely that anything like a central cosmic will, a spirit world, or an eternal survival of personality exists. They are most preposterous and unjustified of all guesses which can be made about the universe. And I am not enough of a hair splitter to pretend I don't regard them as errant and negligible moonshine. In theory, I am an agnostic, but pending the appearance of radical events, or radical evidence, I must be classed practically and provisionally as an atheist. Um, <clears throat> in 1921, Lovecraft released a series of three essays, The Defiance, The Defense Reopens, The Defense Realms Open, Realms? Why well, I can read. The Defense Reopens, The Defense Remains Open, and Final Words. Later published as a collection titled In Defense of Dagon, in which he rebuked a series of criticisms directed at his works. Some notable quotes. I paint what I dream, and will let the public settle the rest amongst themselves. Mr. Mundy asks the uh, raison d'etre of Dagon, d'etre of Dagon, I will give it purely and simply to reproduce a mood. Its object is the simplest in all art, portrayal. The physical horrors of war, no matter how extreme and unprecedented, hardly have a bearing on the entirely different realm of supernatural terror. Ghosts are still ghosts. The mind can get more thrills from unrealities than from realities. Yeah, it's definitely, there's definitely a mood. Like, not a lot happens here, but... Lovecraft was a prominent figure in the world of amateur journalism. In 1915, he started publishing his own journal called The Conservative, which included political and social commentary, poetry, short stories, literary criticism written by him and other authors. Howard was a skilled wordsmith, but also took criticisms to heart, which resulted in his decision to step away from writing poetry and concentration, concentrate on weird fiction again for the first time since his teenage years. Dagon, published in 1917, is one of the short stories written during that period. In this example, excerpt from the conservative, the master of horror fiction explains his attitude towards warfare and the idea of world peace. Why any sane human being can believe in the possibility of universal peace is more than the conservative can fathom. Should the entire civilized world agree simultaneously to disarm, one or more nations would undoubtedly remain secret, retain secret armament, and at the proper time take advantage of their more altruistic and less astute contemporaries in a wild career of conquest against unarmed victims. No country is or can ever be above warfare until the basic impulses of the human animal shall have miraculously changed. A little nihilistic there, buddy. And yet understandable. Once I sought out a not even nihilistic, just fatalistic. I, I think there, there might be another isting with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. Dagon was the main deity of the Philistines, worshipped throughout the Middle East as the ancient god of fertility and crops. In Hebrew, the word Dagon, or Dagan, was common noun for grain. The rulers of Akkad, Mesopotamia, chose him as the patron saint of their war conquests. He also appeared as the judge of the dead in an Assyrian poem and an underworld prison uh, warder in one of the Babylonian texts. 
is often mistakenly taken for a fish god due to the wrong interpretations of his name. As in Hebrew, the word Dag means fish. In Lovecraft's works, Dagon is an underwater deity ruling over the Deep Ones, a humanoid race with fish traits that resides in the oceans. He is worshipped by a secret cult called the Esoteric Order of Dagon. I think they showed just enough of Dagon to make it interesting and a little scary without ruining the mystique of it in this game. But soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. The Necronomicon, eh? August Delroth. Delroth was an American writer and anthologist. He also befriended Lovecraft and published many of his works through his company, Arkham House. Although he greatly contributed to the popularization of the author's works after his death, he is surrounded by numerous controversies. One of his most questionable decisions involved introducing the good versus evil doctrine. Derleth was a devout Catholic to the Cthulhu mythos, which contrasted with Lovecraft's view of the world and his approach to cosmic horror. As a result, the author's works are often misunderstood and misrepresented in today's culture. It's also, also worth noting that Lovecraft was never really interested in creating a mythology, and the term Cthulhu Mythos was coined by Derleth after the author left the mortal plane. Lovecraft's attempts to find a job in 1925 were influenced by advice he received from friends, among others. He started freelancing for marketing magazine, a marketing magazine, where he would write announcements and commercials. Feel free to judge his copywriting skills for yourself. From an ad for Curtis Woodwork. Curtis Woodwork embraces both the usual structural units and the cleverest contrivances of built-in or permanent furniture, such as bookcases, dressers, buffet, buffets, buffets, hmm, and cupboards. Every model is conceived and created with the purest art, ripest scholarship, and mellowest craftsmanship, which energetic enterprise can command. And made to conform rigidly to the architecture of each particular type of home. The cost, considering the quality, is amazingly low. Trademark on the individual pieces prevents any substitution by careless contractors. These days that ad would be like, This is good bookcase you should buy. It's low price. These days, the word scientist is a widely accepted term, but at the time of Dagon, it was a subject to a wide debate. I read that sentence all fucked up. After the author used it in the story, critics pointed out that the man of science was a more appropriate term to employ. He admitted that if Dagon were to be reprinted, he would indeed use the phrase they suggested. Scientist was coined as an analog to artist to be used when referring to those studying different branches of science. Yet. In the 19th and early 20th century, scientific researchers in Great Britain and the United States were of the opinion that man of science resembling the term man of letters was only proper choice, was the only proper choice. Among other things, it was gender specific, indicating that science was an endeavor to be pursued by only one sex. The term scientist became more accepted only after World War II and man of science started fading into obscurity as an old fashioned synonym. I'm learning so much interesting history from this game that I was not expecting at all. I know some people are probably expecting more horror and monsters and stuff night, for Spooptober, but I like this a lot. And waning, but I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am to end it all having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Lovecraft hated tobacco. 
even though he used to smoke when he was 12 in order to look and feel like an adult. His correspondence with his friend Reinhard Kleiner, he claims that he quit as soon as he started wearing long pants. What? He also had a very strong opinion about alcohol, as evidenced by his letter to Zelia Brown. As for the matter of drinking, I have never tasted intoxicating liquor. Never intend to, having a strong aesthetic disgust at anything which blunts, coarsens the delicate nature. Equipos... Equipois? What did it say? Of the evolved human intellect and imagination. Drinking excited my personal repugnance. Hence, I don't drink. Let the herd do what they will. I am rather in favor of prohibition. Prohibition of any one antisocial force as well as of any other. Damn, dude. I think his repugnance would probably have continued to be repugnant regardless of drink. At another house where people were stirring, he asked questions about the gods and whether they danced often upon Lyrian. But the farmer and his wife would often make the Elder Sign and tell him the way to Nir and Ulthar, the dream quest of the unknown Kadath, H.P. Lovecraft. Elder Sign is a protective symbol that can be found in various works of pop culture, usually represented by a five-pointed star with an eye flame symbol in its center. For example, in games inspired by H.P. Lovecraft's writings, it's supposed to ward away all kinds of cosmic horrors. However, there's a later version of the sign created by the author's friend, writer August Derleth. In our game, we have used the original symbol as designed by Lovecraft in the form of a six-pointed branch, which he sometimes included in letters to his friends. Okay. Well, Eternal Darkness is still my favorite game that takes the cosmic horror angle. Often. I ask myself if it could not all have been a pure phantasm. A mere freak of fever as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man of war. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed, worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down into their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind. Of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. <laughs> I wish that final scene didn't remind me of the Godzilla movie from 98. I hear a noise at the door as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. Well, I'm going to check out their other games. That was Dagon. And that was... I, I've only read Dagon once years ago, but I remember enjoying it. And uh, that was definitely... That was definitely Dagon. And um, all the little backstory was good. The, uh, the visuals were nice. It didn't go overboard. It wasn't very playable. Like, it wasn't, like, very interactive, rather. But it was actually really well done. So, I hope you enjoyed as much as I did, and maybe even learned a couple things, too. The Spooptober, uh, 
games, experiences, etc. will continue. And until then, don't forget to check the door. 